بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وبعد ويلكم تو ذا سيريز اون مقاصد الشريعة يوزين ذا بانديميك كرايسيس از كيس ستادي از يو نو تويزداي از ذا تيريتيكال اسبيكت اوف ذا سيريز اند اون تيرزداي از ذا كيس ستادي اون ذا بانديميك توداي وي غنا كونتينيو توكين اباوت the benefit which is al-maslaha uh, 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 in maqasid al-shari'a and on tuesday muhammad gave a very good uh, description of the different dimensions of benefit and today we're hoping to see application on pandemic crisis um, uh, today we have a busy schedule we will be listening to sheikh hamza yusuf uh, with a presentation on one component of uh, uh, the, the case today, uh, followed by Muhammad uh, uh, presentation. And we also are happy to have with us today, Dr. Mahdi Qasqas, uh, who's gonna uh, tackle uh, a component of individual versus collective from a psychosocial perspective. And also brother Khalid Saad, also is going to be uh, speaking with us today on uh, this uh, session. Um, as I just say, uh, this is the uh, agenda of the day. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, ask Brother Mohammed bel but I, I actually never got a chance to introduce Mohammed to the audience. Mohammed bel is uh, a long-term uh, Horizon uh, uh, member, uh, former board member. Um, he uh, headed the, the uh, adult leadership development uh, courses for years now, o over 10 years, uh, and he is uh, a brain behind this series. Um, we work closely together to produce um, these weekly sessions. Mohammed Bliemani um, has a, a background in IT and uh, has an MBA. Uh, and he's uh, working uh, from Toronto, and he's going to speak speak to us today from Toronto. Hamad, please take it. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Nordin. So what we have, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Maqasid over the four weeks, and this week we'll introduce the, the beneficial dimensions uh, as um, as archetypes, so we talked a little bit about the archetypes of the maslaha. And the maslaha you cannot only define it as material or uh, or spiritual, or you cannot even define it as human experience or its divine or wahi revelation side, or you cannot even define it is it only only individual or group uh, dimension or this life and and there and uh, hereafter. So there are these archetypes that we talk about them and we elaborate. Uh, so the 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 purpose, the purpose that we have for today, to, uh, kind of uh, practice or um, application uh, on the pandemic case, is uh, it will it will bring the maqasid um, as a way of uh, clarifying the action, the reconciling. It's reconcile us with what we know as human experience, bringing it into the field of the maqasid as one of the big component. There is no maqasid without human experience. And this is what we talked a lot about it last time. So, and we talked a lot that there is no maqasid, only the material side of it. And this is the assumption that a lot of people, once they start talking about maqasid, they just, they have in the background, oh, this is the, the material kind of maslaha and so on. So this is where we questioned this, this assumption about maqasid and we shake them and we say that the maqasid, the place for us as individual, a way to reconcile our uh, spiritual, religious life with what we experiment as human, rational and experience. So this is kind of reconciliation, one, one, one level of reconciliation. Another level of reconciliation is reconciliation of the different verses in the Quran to, uh, to, to have something in common. So we have verses, and maybe if you look at them separately, they are contradictory, and we talked about that last session. But if you see that there is maqasid, they are the guidance. So there is no nasq, no, uh, uh, no, no thing that kind of, um, um, uh, uh, kind of overwritten. There is, uh, there is a rule, and there is overwritten rule. Uh, and, uh, there is, and there is no thing that is 
uh, you can take it as you want. There is, a, there is some guidance and you need to take it from there in order to move in your reconciliation with the understanding of different pieces of the Quran. The, so we'll talk uh, today as a topic, we are tackling the maqasid from this perspective of reconciliation of those dimensions. And uh, it's a reconciliation between the heart and the spiritual with the material, reconciliation between our human experience with the divine and the way, reconciliation as individual ten, uh, temptation to achieve our maslaha with the group benefit, uh, and the re reconciliation between the life uh, and the challenges and the benefit of uh, or that's that we have in our current life in the, with the, with the, with the, with the benefit that we may gain in uh, um, the hereafter. Um, so uh, inshallah we'll uh, start by uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. It's uh, it's a good kind of uh, at least uh, a remembrance of what what's behind uh, the, the 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 this turbulence or at least this pandemic situation. Uh, and uh, how it's linked with this level of reconciliation in the level of spiritual uh, level. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidu Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira alhamdulillah. One of the great books of our civilization is known as Al-Maktubat. It was written uh, over 400 years ago by a man who was Sheikh Ahmed al-Faruqi al-Sarhindi who is also known as uh, Mujaddad al al Thani, the renewer of the second millennium, uh, really truly extraordinary scholar. But one of his maktubat is the uh, 19th maktub, and it was to Sayyid al Mir Muhammad Nu'man, and it was about patience and also being content with the decree of Allah. And in it he says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Fis Sarra'i wa Darra'i wa Fil Afiyati wa Balai. فَعِلُهُ الْحَكِيمِ جَلَّ سُلْطَانُهُ لَا يَخْلُوا عَنْ حِكْمَةِ He begins praising Allah, the Lord of the worlds, in, in sarra and darra, in hardship and, and in ease, in times of joy and times of sorrow, times of difficulty and times of ease. And then فَالْعَافِيَةِ وَالْبَلَى When one is in well-being and in, when one is in tribulation. Al-afiyah is a, one of the comprehensive Arabic words for simply well-being. Um, when somebody has the afia, they're healthy, but it's also a psychological well-being, a spiritual well-being. It's a, it's a really beautiful word. Al-bala is the tribulation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in many verses in the Quran about bala, that the world is a tribulation, Allah will try us in the world. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Shaddukum bala'an al-anbiya thumma al-amthal fal-amthal that the people that have the most tribulations in this world are the prophets and then those closest to them. And there's a hadith also, either Ahabbullahu qawman abtalahum. If Allah loves people, He gives them a lot of tribulations. And part of the wisdom of that is that He makes the world uncomfortable for the people He loves because the world is not their natural resting place. It's not a place where they, He wants them to feel comfortable. So Allah will throw difficulties into your life. In fact, Sayyid Nursi actually says that sometimes he'll give you physical tribulations just so that you're uncomfortable in order to want to get out of this world and meet your Lord and be with your Lord. So it says, فِعْلُ hakim jalla sultanuhu la yakhlu an hikmah The actions of the wise, Al-Hakim is one of the names of Allah and it comes from hakama yahkumu which is to judge a thing and you need wisdom to judge. And so uh, whatever he decrees is out of his wisdom. So he says no action of the Hakim is out of uh, foolishness. It's always a wise thing. And then la'allallah yuridu bihi salah That God can do something that you think is, is not a good thing for you, but he's actually doing it to rectify you or to bring about some rectification. And then he quotes the Quran, وَعَسَنْ تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَنْ تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So he says that maybe, and this is from the Quran, maybe you detest a thing and in it is good for you, and maybe you love a thing and in it is harm for you. And, and God knows, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, and you don't know. So that, that's the operative uh, meaning to take from that is that 
you have to trust uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that what's happening to you is happening for a wisdom because he is al-Hakim. So then he says, and this is the advice of uh, Sayyid Ahmed Sirhindi, فَاصْبِرُوا عَلَى بَلَائِهِ وَرْضَوا بِقَضَائِهِ Be patient with the tribulations he gives you, but also be content with his decree. Be content with his decree. Because the sakhat, being angry at the decree of Allah, is one of the deepest sicknesses of the heart. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَثْبُتُوا عَلَى طَاعَاتِهِ وَاشْتَنِبُوا عَنْ مَعَاصِي and also be firmly resolute in, in, in your obediences to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoid any disobediences. Subhanahu, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. This is what people who believe in Allah say when idha asabatum musibatun. When they're afflicted by any calamity, they say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We belong to Allah and to Him we're returning. So these calamities are from Him to remind us and to bring us back to him. قَالَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَى وَمَا أَصَابَكُم مِّن مُصِيبَةً فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ That no calamity afflicts you except it's from what your own hands have wrought. In other words, any tribulation that comes to us as a species and us as individuals, we actually deserve it. وَيَعْفُ عَنْ كَثِيرٌ And he forgives much. He forgives much that he's doing. And so that's a, another really important thing to remember is that everything that afflicts us comes from our own selves and yet he forgives many many things. So this is one of the foundational metaphysical principles that the Quran um, has and it's, it's very important for Muslims to remember that because a lot of Muslims now tend to want to blame uh, things outside of themselves and, and, and always look that it's somewhere else. If you, if you read the Qur'an, what you'll find is that the, the person that blames in the Qur'an is Iblis. And the person that takes responsibility is Adam salam. And this is why Adam was given the Khilafa, the Caliphate, over Iblis. Because Iblis blames, he even blames Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bima aghwaytani. Because you led me astray. This is what Iblis says to God. Because you led me astray, I'm going to lead all of them astray. This is a sickness. It's a disease uh, of, of blaming the other for what happens. This doesn't mean that there is not uh, wrongs and rights in the world. And, and a lot of people confuse this because you can look at, at things at the political level and then you can look at them at the metaphysical level. If you look at them at the political level, you have to deal with them as political problems. So there are oppressors and there are oppressed. There's right and there's wrong. But if you look at things at the deeper level, which is the metaphysical level, it enables you then to grapple with right and wrong in a way that doesn't destroy your heart. But if you forget that balance, it's having bifocular vision, it's having when you have glasses, uh, some people need bifocals. So you can see far and then you can see close. The political is looking close, but the metaphysical is looking far. And so this is not denying that there are, are egregious wrongs being done by some people against others. But spiritually, how do we understand those wrongs? That's the metaphysical question. And by metaphysics here, I'm really talking about the spiritual and the deep understanding of the reason for existence, the reason for tribulation. These are the things the Quran, in essence, is explaining these things and it takes a great deal of effort to really understand them at a deep level. So he says that no uh, calamity comes except it's what your own hands have wrought. And this is also reiterated in several verses in the Quran. In Surah Al-Rum, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, that ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيد الناس. That corruption or pollution, fasad has a lot of meanings in Arabic, ha have, has manifested on the land and in the sea because of what humanity's own hands have earned, because of what they were doing. So this fasad that appears in the world is from what people were doing. ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا in order to let them taste some of what they were doing. So the, the corruption that ensues from wrong action is in order for us 
to taste some of what we were doing, that perhaps they might go back to God, might make tawbah, might ask for forgiveness. So the things that happen to us are to bring us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very difficult for people to understand, but this is a reality. And then, uh, and then uh, he says, فَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا عَمَّا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِينَا So turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask forgiveness of what our own hands have earned. وَسَلَ الْعَفُ وَالْعَافِيَةِ And ask God for pardon and well-being because those come from Allah, من Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِنَّهُ تَعَالَى يُحِبُّ الْعَفْوَ وَاشْتَنِبُوا عَنَ الْبَلَاءِ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ And also avoid calamities and tribulations as much as you're able to because we can actually bring these things upon ourselves. So we bring calamities upon ourselves and then we blame others for it. Um, it's, it's like somebody who, you know, they eat poorly and they, and, and, and they, they don't exercise and, and they and all these, they do horrible things, they don't rest enough, and then they get sick, and they say, oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tried me with illness. The reality of it is, is you made yourself ill. So if you were exercising, if you were eating well, if you were getting good sleep, if you were doing all the right things, and then you get sick, that's ibtida from Allah. But if you aren't doing any of those things, and then, and then, and then you get sick, you have no one to blame but yourself. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man wajada khayran fari ahmadillah, wa man wajada ghayra darika fala yalumna illa nafsa." That the Prophet ﷺ said, "Whoever finds good, let him praise Allah subhanahu wa taala, because all good is from Allah. But whoever finds other than good, let him only blame himself." This is a Sahih hadith. So then he says. Don't take on tribulation more than you can bear. فَإِنَّ الْفِرَارَ مِمَّا لَا يُطَاقْ مِنْ سُنَنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ عَلَيْهِمْ الصَّرَوَاتُ وَالتَّسْلِيمَاتِ Because fleeing from what one is unable to bear is from the sunan of the messengers. It's from the way of the prophets and the messengers. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ, he made hijrah because it was becoming impossible for them to live in Mecca because of the tribulations that were there. The Prophet ﷺ left, I mean he was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to make hijrah to Medina, but this is a teaching for us. You have in the Messenger of Allah the best example. So this is a teaching for us to understand that the Prophet ﷺ, he fled tribulations that, that he couldn't bear. And he taught people to do this. And this is why when, when some of his uh, soldiers uh, fled uh, a, uh, a situation where uh, they were overwhelmed, the odds were against them, they, the, some of the Sahaba, when they got back to Medina, they blamed them and said, oh, you fled the battlefield. He said, no, they, 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 what they did was that was the right thing to do. He said they weren't farin, they were karin. They, they, they were people um, going to, to fight another day. And so that's important uh, for, for people not to take on tribulations that they can't bear and to flee from situations that will overwhelm them and test them. And a lot of our young people need to learn this. Um, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-mu'minu la yudhillu nafsahu. The, the believer will never humiliate himself. And Sidi Ahmed Zarruq and others have said that it's when you actually go up against uh, odds that are overwhelmingly against you. And for instance, if you go into a, a combative situation where the odds are overwhelmingly against you, and then you're humiliated by it. So, وَنَحْنُ uh, فِي الْبَلَى And then he says, we are in the عَيْنَ الْبَلَى in the world, we're in the, the source of tribulation. The very nature of the world is tribulation. So the world is tribulation. And yet we are in it in well-being. Uh, and this is a great gift from Allah, is to ask Allah for well-being. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ asked Allah, Allah minisuk al-afu wal-afiyah wal-mu'afat al-da'ima fi dini wa dunyaya wa ahli wa mali واستر عوراتي وآمن رعاتي واحفظني بين يدي من خلفي وعن يمين وعن شمالي من فوقي وأعوذ بك أن أخترم تحتي 
That dua was said after every single prayer in one recension. So the Prophet ﷺ said that dua, I ask you for pardon and for well-being and for continuous well-being and for protection, to protect me in front of me, behind me, on the left of me, to the right of me, uh, protect me from being assassinated or killed from underneath me, like mines and these horrible things. Um, so uh, asking Allah for afiyah is very important. The Prophet asks for afiyah every single day. But ilahi subhanahu alhamdu wa minnatu wa salamu alaykum wa ala sa'ir sa'iri man ittiba' al-huda wal tazam mutaba'at al-mustafa. So peace be upon you and on the, all those who follow the guidance and follow uh, cling to following Al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi As-Sarawatu Wa Taslimatu Al-Ula Alhamdulillah Jazakumullah Khairan Sadar Muhammad Thank you Yeah Yeah so uh, it was it was uh, kind of a remembrance to, uh, to 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 this dilemma to this to 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 a different kind of uh, extreme of the maslah when it comes to the material side and this uh, kind of the spiritual side and this is kind of the essence that we want to take from that uh we need to be critical about the approaches that's fine but at least the essence of the idea here is we need to question our biases when it comes to this type of assessment of these two two dimen uh, two uh, extreme of this dimension or, or of this archetype so there is kind of the material and the spiritual and that was the purpose that we have uh, his talk here uh, now we will uh, talk inshallah just um, uh, uh, elaborating kind of proposal here to to, uh, to talk about the benefit from a classic perspective in terms of decision making process and we will uh, we'll see how this uh, decision making process could have some 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 issues that we need to clear in the in, in our path before we 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 move on it's not about instrumentalization about the process but it's more about to making it more practical and to making it in the level that we can act on it so that's the purpose a uh, little bit here and we want to just to uh, kind of to have kind of uh, and to seek kind of uh, inter uh, debate about the idea and how we can make it even uh, better from this perspective so the benefit and we talked about the benefit uh, when when it comes to these dimensions that it requires action that it requires some effort in order to make the benefit happen between this this extreme kind of situation and the for that it it comes from reflection you need to start kind of thinking so there is thinking process that could happen before 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 tackling and getting into the into the field of elaborating and exploring where is the benefit and there is kind of background kind of reflection that need to have that we need to have that it's kind of be equipped with some level of clarity and to be really critical because you can fail uh, and and fall on some level of the biases that will give get you targeting some benefits that are not even um uh, it's just coming from your biases and here we will uh, we'll talk a little bit about the biases when it comes to this situation of covid 19 and we'll get into that. The, the second uh, element that we want to talk, to talk about it here, it's just visualization and to see from situation that we, we, we are, we are, uh, we are uh, facing, how we, how we can proceed in order to um, kind of adopt one of the uh, decision-making process and to move on in order to make, uh, uh, to, make, uh, to make steps forward and to have ideas and to have options so you can start assessing the situation and you can start filtering. This is the third item, the, that the benefit requires some refinement and filtering. So you need some level of uh, 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 system that you can bounce your benefit against the criteria so you can filter them. So here I will just uh, uh, give a glimpse of thinking and we can get back to that once we, we start the discussion. 
uh, it's uh, it's more about the situation and the, we are imagining that we have kind of situation, especially kind of the pandemic and it could be kind of individual level or institutional level or collective level or societal level. Uh, so when it comes to, the, uh, to, to this situa situation and you want to define the benefits that you want to target, that you want to, to have, so you are aiming for finding the benefit to explore for those benefits so it's not it's not wise to just take whatever you have as available because some benefits are coming just as a chain of benefits and we want to mine them in order to make the prioritization in order not to to fail at least or to fall into this bias of the, ben the material benefits are taking more priority or the spiritual benefits are taking more priority and this is what we can find in a lot of scholars or maybe this is more about the, the wahi and the revelation and unseen and it's all about this hidden world it doesn't have anything to do with this real world and so on so you don't want to get into this level of the biases so you want to go through the process and whatever you take as a process, you think through it, you can question it. You can see the essence of what you are doing. Here I'm presenting just as a, a, a representation, some generic uh, decision-making process. You are coming from the benefits kind of uh, uh, questioning. So you can go through, through this is, it could be adopted generically or the decision-making uh, process could be kind of modeled in this generic way, or this uh, rap kind of decision-making process that's coming from decisioning uh, or a decisive book, if you if somebody has has a chance to, to look at it, uh, this is the Maqasidi kind of decision framework that is coming from the the, the the arena of the religion, and you are thinking from the Sharia ch or from the is uh, from the essence of the text to get some outcome to get some outcome as benefit. So you have some bias, though right you are coming from the arena of the religion you are coming from the perspective of the book so do you have your bias so you need just to mind your biases as you are coming either from outside the arena of the text or from within the arena of the text both of them are coming from allah and both of them are part are, are the source of the benefit so it could be human experience benefit as it could be kind of revelation benefit so if you choose either from outside or inside you need to just to mind it and to have kind of clarity about it or the last one which is here design thinking or even other ones if you want um, so once you have once you have this uh, process that you go through it in order to identify and to explore your the benefit that you have in place as options you are going through the some stage of uh, of the filtering and then the, the filter, it comes by, by questioning your benefit. How far they are fulfilling all the dimensions? How far? Because this is kind of, you can, you can make it fulfill, fulfilling those dimensions by your action, by your decision. You can take kind of one of the benefits and you look at it. What is my dimension, spiritual dimension on it? What is my divine and related kind of uh, revelation dimension on it, if there is any. What is the hereafter for this benefit if I'm taking it as my option? What is my human experience in order to bonify it with some practical and the eff effective kind of process to making it happen? What is this individual component that I can serve or have it as benefit and what is the group component to reconcile them so this is kind of the level of reconciliation you are reconciling the different side of the of the benefit in order to making it viable to be adopted and then this is kind of the process of the filtering once th that require effort that require specific clarity about you, what you have in mind a specific clarity about your process and maybe sometimes it's required to to run it through more than one process, the decision uh, kind of making process, and we'll talk about that when it comes to the bias. And as a result, you will narrow your options to opt for one, two, three benefits, you integrate them and you aim for them, and you put them as your target. But it comes, it doesn't come that way, it doesn't come without effort. And this is what we want to highlight here. So when it comes to, the, to, this, uh, to this process, you want to clear what is what are your biases because the biases and as we will see here they have a big uh, impact on the way you are 
opting or you are exploring or you are looking and seeking for which benefit you want to have. And uh, this is, uh, I'm taking this kind of uh, uh, initial framework and we want to get from it, from this one to generalize it a little bit in our discussion. But just, I will just frame that one to cover it quickly, inshallah, for, for, for the benefit of the discussion. Uh, so this is kind of one of the article that's kind of just uh, uh, released um, uh, last, week was two weeks i guess uh the april some 25th i guess uh so this is the the, the source you can go uh, back to it and you can just look look uh, at the dimension and how people they are looking at the biases when it comes when it comes to the uh, this uh, making a decision so they, here they are kind of common biases and one of them i will stop i will start from the status uh co bias and the status quo bias is the uh, it kind of involves considering the current state of affairs uh, to be kind of optimal uh, and uh, anything uh, different uh, is less uh, it's just loss failing to adjust to new kind of realities like wh wh whatever we are doing uh, kind of facing the the, the covid 19 this is the optimal way and then you will face that you 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 are lacking data. And this is this is the the one of the nature of this pandemic. Each time they are discovering other factors that they need to take in consideration. So they cannot so they cannot uh, they cannot kind of expect kind of deadline. So there is some unknown factors, and those unknown factors it requires from us the the adaptability adaptability the, the, to be adjusting. And the, one of the bias, or oh, what we are doing is way enough. And that will affect the way you are looking at the, the, the benefit. Is it to adjust first before you to move to the next phase, to even to question the status quo before to do something? And it comes to our religion. It comes to our benefit, individual benefit. And we need just to, 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 to take it from here. And this is... Um, one of the biases the second one is the political bias which is uh, uh kind of uh, uh intervene in the way the people uh, interpret the information in either the kind of real information but it get interpreted or fake news it's like they get in the fake news because of the political position that they have uh we 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 we, we saw that for example in the in the in the example of the fox, fox news uh when there was uh, kind of uh, when in the in the first weeks uh, it's not first week it's just in the, the march march uh, month i mean they start talking about the covid 19 as uh, uh, an anti uh, kind of um, uh, trump hoax for example and this is uh, this is this because they are taking one position uh, in the, in the in the opposite side we saw that the cnn for example because they are taking different position uh, they spend a lot of time uh, criticizing trump uh, administration and what happened because you are taking political position, you are in getting engaged from specific position that you get some bias and you don't see the benefit as, as it should be. You are not questioning, as, are you aiming for the benefit by doing that or not? And this is one of the bias. It's a more political, but we can have some projects in the individual level or some uh, projection on our affiliation level uh, in our community, for example. Uh, the, the, the third one, which is conf confirmation bias, it's more uh, um, wider than the political because it, this is kind of, it covers also the ideology uh, level of, uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of this confirmation bias. Um, and it happened, uh, for example, if you are against, uh, against China, uh, for example, and you you are probably uh, more comfortable with uh, with uh, with Trump uh, tweets, for example, in that in that uh, regard, and just because you are coming from this ideology or you you, you get this confirmation. Since I'm against China, what he, they are doing in other parts of the world, so I'm adopting. I'm just binding myself to some position without questioning. And this is kind of the bias that, or even as a Muslim, and we, we already noticed that some scholars getting in the first period of time when they were talking about this COVID-19, some scholars, because they have this against mind, against uh, China position uh, because of the Uyghur issue, 
regardless if the ogre is there, does it have to do with your position or not? That's something that happened to our scholars. And because of the ogre issue, they took position that this is punishment from Allah. And this is good that is happening to them and so on. And this is so our benefit to target is just to making it as hard as possible to the China. And you may miss what is what is your, your, your benefit. It's just because you are coming from this confirmation bias. And to, 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 to look at it, you need to put yourself uh, against the source that contradicts your bias. And this is kind of the, the healing part if you want to, to aim for some level of getting uh, kind of at least cured from this level of the biases at least. Um, the, the, the fourth one, which is availability heuristic, um, and this one has to do is like as example for example and we notice it in the in the beginning again uh, maybe in the first two months and second month even when the we we saw some celebrities getting affected by the by the disease or by, by the virus i mean or some political kind of uh, leaders getting the, the the virus so what happened it became that our uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, anecdote it becomes our anecdote and all what we are talking about talking about the oh look at this uh, virus how just it is and we are talking about justice somehow we got into this level of debate and superficiality to look uh, and to get hooked with what's happening as available information and what happened we get hooked that we are talking about something meaningful but we are wasting we see the whole focus we are we seen uh, even making us overlook more important patterns that are happening. It's not only the pattern that some people are getting sick and the other regardless of their position. There are some deep patterns that we need to look at them, how, we, uh, how the, 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 the poor people are suffering, something like that. For example, if I'm biased about the poor people, for example. But this is kind of the, 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 the arena that you need to pay at some attention uh, and don't uh, don't just uh, uh, go by what's uh, what is available. What is available, it just uh, the lead you to to some level of superficiality and some level of distraction. Um, there is another bias here, which is the framing effect, and the framing effect is uh, is very very important because the way we frame uh, the idea in our head. Uh, and uh, the way we are looking at our benefit completely in the opposite way. Uh, for example, when it comes to the debate, uh, for, this is kind of another political, but just take it as example and lead it more in our discussion to our context. Uh, for for in, in the, in the, all the time in the COVID uh, kind of pandemic, we had this situation where they are talking about save the economy or lock everything down. And when we saw the debate between Trump in one position, I'm the saver of the economy and the, all the scientists kind of uh, had, no, we are for the lockdown and the health and the people and we become seeing activists. It's just because we are framing it that, that way. Do we need to frame it this way or not? Do we need in order to get our benefit? Do we need to get ourselves look down either in one side or the other side and we need to look at that so don't question the framing question the framing of uh, uh, of your of your uh, of, of the situation or how you are looking at it and uh, and uh, kind of um, uh, look for, for for possibility where there are other framing not only don't go for one framing go with multiple framings and look for uh, not uh, uh, binary position framing, either this one or this one. Go for multiple framing, go through multiple decision making process in order to question how you are framing the question and the situation. Uh, the, 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 the one after is the bandwagon effect, uh, and it has to do with uh, inaccuracies uh, and the invalidity of ideas. And uh, that one, for example, um, it's uh, we we all noticed uh, at one point, and there was kind of people laughing on 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 the situation. Some people taking position, some people just using it. But uh, we what what we noticed a um, couple of weeks or uh, something like that. Uh, growing excited about the the old uh, kind of drug of um, uh, color 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 rocking. 
sorry, I would believe. This is the chloroquine that uh, they used to use for the malaria treatment and, and so on. Uh, so they, they took it as, as, as a possible uh, antidote to the virus. It could be kind of one of the, the, the drugs that they may use. So it was kind of discussion. And there was discussion about the, the bandwagon effect as example. So it just started like that. Trump jumped on that bad wagon early before uh, without proof. And this is the bandwagon effect. The bandwagon effect is like when, uh, when there are some ideas that are coming in with a lot of inaccuracies and they grow fast until some other ideas come more wise to clear them down. And this is the band bandwagon. It's like we get excitement every time. Oh, that one, oh, that, this is the, and we start kind of politicizing, taking position and so on. Take, take position, but questioning the ideas. The ideas are not the, 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 uh, accurate by essence. You need to question them. You need to follow scientists and journalists skeptical of, of uh, bandwagon. You need to take this position. You need to have, to have it in mind. Um, so you can at least scope what is type of, of, of the benefit. So you don't jump for something that is not even beneficial. Um, hostile attribution bias, and this is difference uh, between us and others. And uh, for example, what happened as an example uh, regarding this case, uh, it was uh, also kind of, uh, it was noticed more in the beginning, uh, uh, lockdown and uh, people need to stay um, home and uh, um, uh, social distancing. And what we noticed, and it was um, here in US, even in um, other countries, when we saw people by getting shocked with the situation, they opt to go outside. They go outside, either some people just to pray for Allah, some people just individually to go and, uh, and, and take a, a walk or take commute uh, with themselves and, uh, and, 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 and just contemplate about the situation, how they are dealing with it as, as individuals. And because we don't know their situation, the, 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 the media and the politics, they start putting them in the situation that they are against, they are, they are kind of uh, uh, violating the, the law. It's, it's not, it's, is it the right position to put the opposite people, especially in the crisis, directly and quickly and, and, and with, 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 with some um, uh, not mature judgment in the position of adversary, or in, or in the position of hostile? And this is kind of questioning. Don't mm -hmm. the, the jump in to take position based on this bias will make you miss what is your essence of the benefit that you, you are aiming for. Um, the, the next one we, we have here is the neglect of probability and specifically the, the, the epidemiology arena and, uh, and, and the healthcare as a whole is more probabilistic. The lot of times, even if they are talking about the drug, it doesn't resolve all the cases 100%. Uh, and even the situation gets even worse, it doesn't kill all the people at one time. So this is kind of probabilistic. And it, it becomes even more hard to predict when we, are, we don't have even the data. So there is probability and there is lack of the data. So we cannot even do some simulation to be closer to what is the probability uh, there. So we can take at least position. So, and a lot of people, they are not comfortable with probabilistic thinking. They are not. So they, they would uh, rather aim from some, some predefined position just to feel comfortable. And this is their bias. And you need to, to, be, to, be, to be aware about that because you can jump take positions that you want to feel comfortable and you, you miss what is the nature of the, the, the situation that you are dealing with. So that bias can, can definitely may, make you opt for some uh, benefit that are not really beneficial. For you. And here, when it comes to the probabilistic, you are looking at the situation, the, the wise position is just to take it at the level to deal with it with probability and reducing the, uh, the area of infection and so on. Just take it as probability because they are unknown there. So as individual, you are taking it from this uh, perspective. And the, the last one here is the normalcy bias, which is related to unwillingness and the inability to plan for uh, unforeseen. 
So what's happened, um, it's happened to the human being that we have a lot of pandemics in our history. It's happened to us even in this century, we have the Spanish flu, it's 1918, or we have the SARS, or we have a lot of kind of pandemic that happened to us. And every time we take it as this is kind of as, as a normal, that's, that's uh, the, the, the belief that things will continue to go as they, they've gone in the past. Nothing, nothing new. It's just, it's just exception. It just happened and exception. So those pandemics will not come uh, anymore. And whoever came into the play to question this bias, for example, Bill Gates, when he did that TED talk, whatever, or what, what, what the situation of the people, they blame, oh, they know what's happening. This is why he's talking about it. It's just questioning the bias that we have. It's happened to us many times. We need to question it. And this is kind of core for all of us. When we are dealing with our human experience, it doesn't have to happen to me individually. It happened to other people, it's happening. So you are taking it as example and you are building on the top of it. So you, the, one of the bias is to neglect, to neglect that the situation you need it requires from you the witness and the ability to plan for something not predicted right away. It just is probabilistic and it could happen and you need to be aware about it and you need to plan your benefit based on those, uh, those, uh, those ideas. So here, just to conclude, uh, Kahneman in his book, uh, Think Fast and Slow, uh, for example, he laid down a lot of, lot of uh, biases related to the statistics and psychology and stuff. Uh, it's very, very good kind of perspective he's seeking uh, there. Uh, points that the, he points, uh, points out that knowing about these decision biases um, in general doesn't necessarily mean that any, any, any one of us can identify our own biases because they are our own biases and we are thinking from within those biases sometimes, a lot of times, we don't even know that we have those biases. So one of the, uh, the, 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 the action that we need to take from this lesson, and if we want to aim to target our benefit and to, to seek for our benefit and to identify them and filtering them and questioning them, and we need just to voice, to voice how we are looking at the benefits, to voice it with other people and to seek for advice from the trust advisors. Where are our biases talking about this benefit? help us to frame it properly, to help us to look at some biases in order to clear them and remove them. Uh, and in the organizational level, the organization that have systematic kind of discussion about the, the decision-making process, you find their, their, their members start to be aware about the biases that are coming from within each, each one of them because they are questioning the process, they are questioning from where you are coming, they are questioning and bouncing the ideas. It's kind of path uh, to, to, to nurture our capability as a human being, looking for the maqasid as a benefit. Mohamed, this is very good uh, piece here on the uh, uh, benefits and the decision making. Uh, and the different dimension and different biases that you've uh, presented here. For the sake of time, because we have a couple of other interventions, we'll, we'll get back to the question um, after uh, we hear the other speakers. Uh, at this time, I wanted to introduce Brother Khalid Saad, uh, who's going to talk to us about the benefit between the divine and the human experience. Brother Khalid? Assalamu alaikum. Ramadan Mubarak, inshallah, So uh, I want to focus about, uh, speak about something uh, that al ahkam tabi'a lil masalih wal mafasid. That uh, the laws or the judgments uh, are uh, followed like uh, to interest and uh, corruption. So there is two main streams in this uh, uh, in this uh, issue, which is first it calls the uh, التجاه الأشعري, and it says like what what it what they consider, 
يعتبر قبل ورود الشرع والشارع لا يتصف الشيء بنفسه في نفسه بقبح ولا بحسن ولا بنجاسة ولا بطهارة. So the thing before the laws has been sent to us, the thing the thing cannot be judged by itself whether it's ugly or good or good, what whether it's pure or najis. What is hara, hara, uh, halal or haram? So uh, from this perspective, it says a shari' who man ansha. He is the one who made it. The husni wal qubh wal thawab wal iqab wal tahara wal najasa, etc. So it says the shari' which is the law uh, that have been the shara' that has came to us. Who he is the one who uh, established. الحسن والقبح والثواب والعقاب. The other part, it, uh, the other direction, uh, which is more uh, called the الاتجاه العدلي. It contains the معتزلة, the شيعة, the other uh, people. It says بأن كل مفردة في الواقع مطلوبة واقعية جاء الشارع وكشف وأخبر. يعني so uh, here it says in each word or synonym. Uh, it's in by itself we know it there is uh, and they considered uh, the ayah fitrat allah alladhi fatara an-nas alayha so you know by your fitra that lying is good but uh, uh, lying is bad but speaking uh, uh, the truth is is good uh, so i want to speak about the maqasid now maqasid regarding harmness and uh, and uh, Getting benefits. Uh, first, what's the maqsad? Al maqsad huwa ma yuqsad ulayh, awa ma yurma ulayh. The purpose it's what to uh, get the core of everything we do in this life. We should have a core in this life. So, for example, ya ayyuh al nas, abdu rabbakum ladi khalaqum wal ladina man qablakum laallakum tattaqun. So all the ibadat should have uh, taqwa, or there is. There is too much in Quran. لعلكم, 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 لعل... uh, one, one major thing is taqwa. What has been taqwa has been defined in Quran. وتعاونوا على البر والتقوى ولا تعاونوا على الإثم والعدوان. What what the major uh, of ibadat? It comes to one uh, one one of the major things is to have taqwa. And what has been taqwa has been defined in Quran. Uh, cooperate. على البر for goodness and taqwa and don't cooperate على الإثم to be sinners and عدوان don't do aggression any doing aggression aggression like for example if Canada steals from United States about COVID-19 anything they have discovered this is عدوان you can do aggress verbal you can do aggression by hands there is too much aggression so the, the major thing is uh, uh, accepting the accepting the truth is one of the things not not doing uh, aggression. Uh, so and there there is uh, too many other things. There is the uh, there is uh, the uh, the purpose of zikr. Wazkurullah kama zikrukum li abakum. Not saying Allah Allah. Putting Allah in your mind. Is always whenever you do all the things in uh, in your life, whether uh, you are doing uh, things out with people, how you interact with people, there is uh, the the purpose of al falah and al falah huwa al zafar bil murad, and there is ghayat al shukr. There is the purpose of shukr, uh, saying uh, thank thankful, and uh, thankful being by activating your ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Allah gave us. Too many blessings gave us the blessing of uh, hearness to use it to listen to good things. The eyes, the brain, our bodies are amanat. So everything has to be activated. That's the ghayat uh, al-shukr. Wa'amalu ala Dawood shukran For example, there is the uh, ghayat al-falah, as you said. Because these comes with categories. The falah, it comes with the most. And the zafar bima hu al-murad, as we said. Zafar bi is getting what what you uh, why we do all these purposes. 
So the maqasid of a sharia sometimes in the it might be uh, the hukum is uh, contradicting the uh, appearance of the nas, but it, it tackles the nas, the, the context with its purpose. For example, when Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, he opened the uh, Iraq and there was the Ard al-Sawad and he uh, asked the Ahl al-Madina and they were used to be, uh, they used to be, uh, do plants and other things. So he told them, what's the, what, what do you guys think? What should I do in, in, such, uh, in such a situation? They told him, it's better if you uh, uh, do planting for this uh, uh, land and give it to the people. And uh, I don't have much of time. I wanted to speak a lot, but Jazakumullah khair, and this is my interaction. Assalamu alaikum wa Jazakumullah khairan, uh, Brother uh, Khalid, uh, for shedding some light on the benefits between the divine and the experience. Um, we'll go on to the third and last intervention of the day by Dr. Mahdi Qasqas. Uh, Mahdi Qasqas is a psychologist and uh, um, in social work. Um, Mahdi will be speaking to us on the advantage of maqasid, a psycho-spiritual perspective. Again, we are still talking about the benefit uh, um, uh, from different uh, dimension and the psycho-spiritual uh, perspective is what Mahdi will talk to us about. Mahdi, please. Hey, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Jazakumullah khair. Thank you for having me. Um, I think you know, before we get into uh, the academic concepts and, and uh, theories behind all of this work that we're doing, uh, if we each just think about maqasid in our own lives, especially the psycho-spiritual perspective. So the way we think, like uh, Dr. Williami was talking about the cognitive distortions or the biases in research and the way we think about the world, um, you know, sometimes we forget that... Uh, Biases are not just about uh, the way we think. Sometimes the bias emerges from the way we feel. So there's something called emotional reasoning. That is basically it's summarized as I feel this way, therefore it must be true. So if you think about during COVID-19 pandemics, no matter what knowledge is out there, it, it, it's similar to Islamophobia, where people sometimes think, well, I know I'm wrong, I know this is not right, but I feel like I just have to, you know, just be cautious, just be safe. So I think with when it comes to maqasid, um, you know, like uh, Dr. Khalid said before me, it's the why behind everything, it's the purpose, like what is the ultimate objective? So today's brief introduction uh, is trying to get ourselves more congruent you know we have this knowledge and we have this action that we need to be doing um, when it comes to academia uh, whose knowledge is it and, and action for who and in what context you know all of these heuristics and assumptions and biases and purposes behind uh, research and all the stuff that we're trying to develop um, you know to what end why What's the purpose of it all? So if you were to ask yourself today, like, what, why am I even here on earth? That's not a question that you should be able to answer in a minute. In fact, I, I'm very, very cautious when it comes to psychological manipulation of people in power, especially teachers, instructors. Uh, you know, you're at a halaqa and somebody just pops up with a, you know, a question. What's your purpose in life? Well, I don't know my purpose in life. Am I supposed to know that now? And sometimes we don't. And sometimes that's okay. It's definitely okay to feel imbalanced. The problem, though, is when our foundation is not solid. So feeling a little, you know, like your health is not as good as it should be, or you're not as happy as you should be, or you're not making as much money as you, as you should be, or your, you know, your relationships are not always that great. Even when it comes to spiritual areas, I mean, you know, you, you commit sin a little too much. You're not praying as much as you should be. And all, these are all the negative aspects when it comes to looking at our overall health and well-being. But if you break it down, 
based on the maqasid al-sharia, based on these five core domains in maqasid, but at an individual level. That's my thesis, is that يعني, Ahlu Mecca adra bi as they say, like the people of Mecca know their hills better than anybody else. Similar to every single one of you listening to me today, you know your life better than anybody else. For somebody to come and tell you that this is how you should live your life, that's a problem. In fact, I won't go into this, but advice is a bad thing. In counseling, advice is a bad thing. It does not mean nasiha. It means something totally different. But that's for another day, inshallah. For today, when we talk about the ultimate purpose of being physically healthy, psychologically healthy, economically healthy, socially healthy, and above all else, spiritually grounded, right, foundation, it's towards this notion of human flourishing, is it not? Towards a path. I mean, we live, we die, then there's Jannah or Jahannam. That's a chronological order of things. That's the way, no offense to the engineers in the room, that's the way they like to see the world. There's an order. It's clear. Step one, step two, step three, done. Right? Now, for me, I have two more minutes to finish up this presentation. I can rush through what I expected to say or end right there. And it would mean different things to everybody here. But ultimately speaking, you have these five domains of our life. When they're congruent, then good things happen. Right? Then you le reach that state of eudaimonia or flourishing or naim. الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرَ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِّينَ I mean, right? That eudaimonia, that sense of happiness, internal blessings, uh, وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ I'm assuming it's connected to Iman, and Iman is connected to Ihsan, right? When it comes to the end game, I, I stop there. What I would like to say, though, is that the advantage of maqasid over other psychological theories is profound. Now, I can just tell you that as an expert. I can, you know, but then again, somebody might say, well, that's a bias. I could say, well, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's what we believe because it's cl clearly stated in the Quran and the Sunnah. Others will come and say, yeah, but that's not academia. And I would say that's wrong because it is academia. In fact, when Khalid uh, before me said the Qawaneen al Quran, la in shakartum la azidanakum, that's a proposition. And the Quran and the Sunnah has all these beliefs and values, but every single perspective has its values, its beliefs, its propositions, especially biopsychosocial models. The only problem is um, when you try to bring multiple disciplines together, there's a risk that one of the disciplines dominates and the others are underrepresented so just putting words together like biopsychosocial spiritual uh, i mean just putting words together and expecting it to work is not academia um in fact when it comes to a biopsychosocial spiritual model yes certainly if i was to when when i write a, a, a publication on my approach i will certainly reference that model as closely related to but in all honesty, here we are in this room. If a doctor says something, and medical doctor, not the other types, um, then we automatically assume that it must be more important. In fact, if a doctor tells you not to fast, you listen to them before anybody else, correct? So the idea is there is a hierarchy, and we can't ignore that hierarchy. And in academia, that hierarchy is tried, they try to alleviate it by using terms like transdisciplinary practice. But we have to realize that Evidence-based practice has multiple factors to it. That's the second diagram there. One, the, the expertise of the practitioner, the best available research out there, but also the patient's worldview, how the patient looks at a situation. So what I tend to do is recognize that the concept of deen in, in maqasid, I call it spirituality. Others may call it something different, but the term spirituality is a stretched concept. What does it mean? How is it defined? What are its characteristics? How is it measured? And the idea here is, does it mean the same thing for non-Muslims as it does for Muslims? All of these factors become very important. So instead of trying to take this model and universalize it, I do the opposite. I localize and I culturally adapt it. So in diagram three, yeah, you could look at it this way that nafs and aql and nasl and mat. So 
um, uh, that you could look at it that way as the, oh, they're interacting and this and that. You could look at them as a hierarchy. And I left that blank because which one do you put first? For our perspective, what's real on the ground is that Muslims value spirituality over everything else, even if they don't practice that. The problem with that model, the basic model, is that, so what? Yeah, okay, the what difference does it make? Instead, diagram six is what I think it should be. And this is the ad, where the advantages really come. Because somebody who is physically ill, psychologically unhappy, economically impoverished, and socially isolated can still feel a sense of eudaimonia, a sense of flourishing and connection to their creator and as though life is really, really, really worth living. But it's all founded upon this foundation, the, the, the spiritual foundation, right? The deen. For some, spirituality is purpose. For others, it's, it's religiosity. For others, it might be family. For others, it might be the environment. Either way, here's just two examples of two actual clients that I've worked with using this model, right? I won't go into too much details, but as you can see, you know, the one on the right, notice how spirituality is not even introduced because this was a very, very, uh, a case that I don't want to, you know, I don't want people asking me questions about it, but the idea is, um, you know, a young girl who was struggling with her sexual identity, a Muslim, believed she was a boy. Parents were freaking out. So if I started with purpose, that's a problem, right? If I started with spirituality, that's going to be a problem. So that's her model. The one on the left is a da'ya, somebody who actually, you know, is trying to uh, uh, develop her own program. Um, and she needed kind of some, some foundation. I'll let you figure out who these two models would be representing. But one of them is a non-Muslim who was struggling with career counseling issues. And the other, uh, well, I won't tell you who the other one is. Thank you guys very much. I hope this introduction was um, a meaningful use of your time. Uh, at the end of the day, this is not a topic that can be discussed in seven minutes. I promise you that. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mahdi, uh, for your intervention. At this point, uh, we open the floor for uh, questions, answer, comments from everybody. Uh, please go ahead, whoever ready to um, um, uh, comment or ask question, and also uh, for those uh, who wanted to write their comment on the chat, uh, feel free. Um, go ahead, please. Uh, because uh, we are maybe few minutes from iftar can i uh, yeah. intervene here with a few remarks Go ahead. Uh, uh, so I, uh, I i like sometimes to come up with um, provocative questions to try to brainstorm more deeper than what we uh, heard so i will start with uh, what we heard from uh, dr hamza and who talked about tribulations and well and uh, but uh, from Quran and from what we can see in life, it's very, very difficult to see things as white and uh, black. And uh, uh, the uh, topic of the goodwill is very, very complicated topic. So in his talk, he said that any good that comes to you is from Allah and any bad things, it's, all, it's from you. But there are other arguments and uh, stories in the Quran which... Uh, uh, show the opposite, uh, going back to the story, for example, of Khidr with the prophet Moses, where Moses was not happy with what he saw, witnesses with the Khidr. Everything went against the rational things we can uh, experience in our life. So the, uh, philosophically, and uh, uh, going to the best great thinkers, even nowadays, the, uh, there are many ways of explaining what is the good way. Sometimes things happen to you, and should you accept them, either they are good or bad, it's very, very, very hard topic, and uh, it's not easy to say this is white and black. Second thing from, uh, uh, so I'm not very familiar. I, uh, I heard last time uh, uh, what Makassis are objectives, and I'm trying to be neutral here. So what I, I heard from uh, the other brother who uh, talks about the biases. Uh, uh, this is provocative remark, and uh, I think that it needs more time to discuss. 
Uh, what I am hearing has nothing to do with the Maqasid's objective. A lot of conclusions or ideas I am hearing now could be heard in, in any rational gathering. So I don't understand well, maybe because I've, I'm not very familiar with the Maqasid framework you are talking about, but without linking the word Maqasid to what you are seeing here, uh, there are many, many uh, gatherings and news and uh, professionals who are sharing the same ideas, the same conclusion. So my question is why Maqasid is always coming to uh, discussions here? Uh, even the last speaker, when he uh, bring the psychology part of his, uh, his talk, uh, I don't see why he's bringing a Maqasid topic. Uh, if it's someone in psychology, maybe he would understand well uh, what his patients are dealing with without bringing Maqasid. So that's my uh, uh, very purpose provocative questions and uh, hope to hear something to catch up with you guys because I'm not very really familiar with the Maqasid uh, metric. Um, Maqasid is the topic of this series. Uh, we've been, this is our uh, sixth week now. Um, we're not going to recap the whole maqasid here, uh, but uh, but uh, they, just uh, to refocus what we're doing this week. This week, we talked that maqasid is here to uh, bring the benefits uh, to humanity and remove any harm from humanity. And uh, then we asked, what is the type of benefit that we need to be seeking? Are all benefits accepted or, or not all benefit accepted. And as you know, we give the example of khamr, of wine. Wine, Quran say wine has benefit in it. Uh, but not all benefit is considered because the harm outweighs the, uh, the, the benefit. And then we started looking at the different dimension of the, of the benefit. And today we are applying those different dimension of the benefit with some case studies on the pandemic. And so Mohammed, uh, um, uh, he gave us a tour of this uh, paper from MIT, where he looked at the different biases and the diff and, and, and in, in achieving benefit uh, or refuting harm. So I'm, I'm just trying to, to uh, link the dots for, uh, for, uh, for uh, where is Maqasid coming when it comes to um, the context of the presentation today. Uh, other questions, please? and comments um i can elaborate a little bit uh, so uh, the, the, that, that was that was the purpose of bringing uh, uh, targeting maqasid as a benefit it could be simulated as decision making process because of the effort that require maqasid to be uh, to be there in order to have them maqasid they don't come as they are they come with the efforts to put it there and uh, in order to, to explore them, in order to identify them and in order to act on them. Uh, and we looked at the Tuesday session that the maqasid is a responsibility. And so maqasid is not something right that you can take it or not. Maqasid, as they are coming, you are part of the, your resp religious responsibility to identify them, to talk about them, to bounce them with the people, in, for the people to get them or for yourself to get them. And uh, we, we went through the Surat al-Mujadala and other verses and so on. So uh, as, as we are coming from this perspective, it was by purpose to bring human experience dealing with the benefit. It was by purpose. So it wasn't by it wasn't kind of oh we do, we 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 want just maqasid to come here and the word maqasid doesn't mean anything and we keep redundancy telling saying it every second and 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 and, and, and one. So in order to make it a little bit concrete, when it comes to the human human experience dimension, the maqasid doesn't take anything else than having decision making process and be rigorous with it in order to, to get it. And just we are a little bit trying to bring mechanism as a practical way for the users, and all of us, we are familiar with those framework. So this is why we put them there generically. Whoever is comfortable with any decision-making process, opt for it. Look for the maqasad, question your biases, and filter them 
through all the dimensions that we talked about, the more archetype that we talked about them. So you can bring and contribute and add value, helping other people to localize their benefits. So that was kind of the, 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 the effort there. The effort there, uh, we use the Quran, we use the Sunnah, we use the historical examples. It's, it keeps themselves quiet and humble to involve action from us. And nothing from us will involve action except something that we used to have and we used to tackle in other areas and we don't recognize it in the maqasid. It's like maqasid something else. And we are questioning that. Yeah. So. I think Mahdi has a comment on this. Yeah, we also have to be careful because remember, we ourselves are biased against Islam. So any Islamic concept that comes... Uh, up, we automatically assume that somehow the Islamic uh, domain is lesser than the other domains. But again, it's it, it's if we're going to develop new uh, uh, constructs that represent our reality, hundred percent concepts like maqasid are are they could be fluid, they could be dynamic, it could be individualized, localized, it could be globalized. But I think at the end of the day. This effort, from what the way I see it, is this is a cumulative effort to mobilize our collective expertise and reach some amazing discussion. I think, I think you've been successful in doing that. We've we've brought in this concept into the minds of people. I would I would caution though uh, that in the act of trying to be uh, balanced, that we don't be imbalanced, right? By trying to show. Uh, that we're being neutral, we're actually going against a marginalized population. So we got to be very careful because social justice matters are very important. Um, I won't go in, I, I'm not targeting that anybody in particular, but when we, when we use any Islamic concepts, I don't think we need to always justify every single step we make. Sometimes we do it, why? Because that's, we're human beings, we're allowed to, it's freedom. So, but I'm just saying, as we move forward, every decision doesn't have to be proven uh, unless it's, it just has to be rooted in some sort of authentic source. In this case, Quran and Sunnah. For others, the journal of medical whatevering, right? Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. So I just want to throw that out there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mehdi. Can I add one last thing? I would love if this kind of stuff was integrated into the leadership programs as well for the youth, like especially this slide you're on right here. This is an amazing thing, the co common biases. Imagine what, what, what our future leaders and scholars would look like if they ingrained this type of thinking in their minds. This is cognitive behavioral therapy at its finest, by the way, just to let you know. Guess what, uh, Mahdi? Uh, our series is called the Adult Leadership Development Course, and it's yeah. all the series we're doing is under the umbrella of our Leadership Institute. Yes, yes, 100%. Uh, material is broken down to the level of the youth uh, some of these concepts are too complex to bring to the youth uh, but others uh, so this specific series is for adults 17 and up who uh, have the ability to uh, who are college students but yeah. ability to have the analysis and the grasp but um, definitely i think there is a 100 you know i'm biased against the leader in me uh, curriculum that's why i'm saying it. i'm like come on you you have better ideas than that leader in me and that stuff but just just joking or not i don't want to start any uh any controversy yet i think i think i put this slide here on the screen because um it is a very important component uh, um that uh, this paper uh, from mit and muhammad uh, did the uh, excellent job um as we uh, grappling with the issues and the, uh, of the crisis of uh, covid 19 uh many of these uh, biases are flagrant and and, and out there and, and not just in the mainstream uh, um, uh, community, but some of it is unique to our Islamic communities. Yeah. And I think we should always, when we point finger outward, realize that uh, four of them are pointing back to us and we should ask ourselves what's in ourselves that we need to uh, uh, change in our thought process um, and how, we, uh, how, how do we seek our benefits how, um, uh, and how do we uh, attempt to remove the harm from our life um, uh, if we don't tackle and if we're not rigorous mm -hmm. in approaching this thinking and I think this uh, paradigm here is giving us pointing to areas that uh, would allow us to uh, 
uh, to discover in ourselves what's wrong. I've, I've said in uh, many khutbahs in the minbar that adults should allow themselves to question their belief once in a while. Because you picked up a belief <clears throat> over your life that are, um, you know, impacted by uh, whatever experience uh, you yeah. went through in your life. But sometimes those beliefs are dysfunctional beliefs and they're really uh, making your life miserable and you don't know why because the, the belief you're carrying um, are blurry in the, the way you see the world. Mm. And then, then you have to ask who invented that belief for you. Yeah, and you find some some uh, some kid in the neighborhood told you that when you were uh, ten. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, is, is don't they say al mudarasa munafasa? Like um, when you're researching, you should be free to just let your soul go free and question everything. Yeah, I think that's part of the essence here of this uh, questioning the biases. And we, first, we have to recognize the biases and then question them. Hundred percent. You know, we are uh, at eight o'clock east uh, east coast and six o'clock uh, uh, mountain here. Um, uh, Mohammed, uh, do you well, have? I see the last word. I have to leave for the the last thing about psychology and what you are doing, guys. If you allow me, um, just uh, less than a minute is uh, going to the linguistical Quran. There is, a, if you look to the whole Quran, there is a lot of nafs. Uh, and uh, in academia, if you want to give uh, the equivalent name to the nerves, uh, a lot of people use consciousness. And uh, I don't know if you are familiar with Jacques Berg, is uh, uh, the one who made the best uh, translation of Quran in French. I like when he said that in a time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, uh, talking to a human being after life, he uses a nafs. There is no gender name, no male or female. And Jacques Berg was talking about the psychology of a ruh, the psychology of the mind, the, of the consciousness. And we, we are lacking, as a Muslim, we are lacking input of real psychology uh, expertise in how to deal with Quran. I'm not talking about basic uh, going through. We need people who are expert, who are mastering anything said by Freud or Carl Jung or anything. So the, in Quran is full, full of school of psychology thinking. And this is maybe something that could be always, uh, uh, you know, put in our mind to understand how how to deal with the Quran. There is a text and context. There's, so there's actually a movement right now. Uh, Islamic integration and, and in fact unfortunately what happens is the the it's it's a very shallow integration I agree with you 100% there's so much more we should be doing alhamdulillah for at least this dialogue has started right but um, when it comes to Carl Jung Freud and some of the psychoanalysis uh, in all honesty some of those uh, uh, perspectives at the foundation of those perspectives, they're incommensurable with Islamic thought because it's at the, the foundation. So at one point in the development, if we're going to integrate the two, there's going to be some sort of clash. And then somebody's going to have to choose whether they're going to accept one uh, uh, political or ideological paradigm. And, and this is normal in philosophy, right? Uh, positivist, post-positivist, constructivist, or the other. I believe honestly that you can have, there's a lot of better ways of developing a deeper understanding of the human condition using Islamic, uh, you know, canon and, and, and uh, sources while looking at some of the other theoretical approaches as examples of, hey, that's why like biopsychosocial spiritual model, anybody can say, oh, but that's already be being done. But that's what everybody says when they don't want to do work. It's being done. So yeah, so I agree with you, brother, whatever you I want to let the uh, brothers in uh, East Coast and sisters to have go have their iftar. Um, everybody. That was. Uh, Salam alaikum. Thank you very much, and keep up the uh, good work. Hope to be back again. Thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, thank you, Jackson. Uh, with that, uh, inshallah, we'll stop here, and uh, we'll talk to you on uh, uh, Tuesday. Tuesday, we have an amazing uh, session where we're going to be uh, talking about the five necessities. We're going to be listening to Dr. Tariq Sweden, 
and to Imam Juhari, who's going to give us a unique perspective on the five necessities when it comes to the issue of slavery, uh, freedom, and uh, the five, as he calls it. Very exciting session. Don't miss it on Tuesday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.